We are in Champions League, man. That was my Dilly din, dilly dong, come on. Ancara Messi, 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 Hello, welcome to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. My name is Gary Kernin. Joining us for this episode is Keir Wenham Flat. He is a strength and conditioning coach based in the US, has worked with elite level rugby players all over the world in places like the UK, China, Australia, Argentina, and Japan. He's now working in college athletics here and has some great insight into different cultures and also how soccer coaches can become more robust with their training always a hot topic so he does some outstanding work on social media that's where i came across him and really excited to hear your thoughts on this one at gary kernin on twitter at gary kernin on instagram this podcast is brought to you by bounce athletics stay tuned for a special offer on custom training balls and dynamo goals for podcast listeners okay here is care enjoy Kier, thanks so much for joining me this morning on the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. Really excited to have you on. Pleasure to be here, brother. Like I said, uh, off air, I, I think I've followed you for uh, since I was an intern. Hey, first question. So recent tweet that really got my attention uh, because I think it's got so much value in getting people to think. You recently posted, uh, someone asked you about training philosophy and intern, and you responded with, when if it's legal and ethical, we'll try We'll try it if it helps us win. We are married to no philosophy or method. Do you think there's a stage where having this philosophy, which is so valuable, and we're all talking about philosophy, this philosophy, that, do it come, does it come to a stage where the philosophy can actually be detrimental and restrictive for a coach? Yes. Yeah. I think when you look at the most accomplished people in the field and you can expand it to sport in general the best people in in coaching and in sport have the ability at the same time to balance very broad perspective and a global understanding of all of the moving pieces and how they interrelate but then at the same time they also have the ability to hone down and be a technician so just to, to you know ignore sport in general you look at someone like elon musk People will talk about him and his his vision is like, we're going to go to Mars within 50 years. And he's thinking about all these different businesses that have to happen in order for that to happen. But then at the same time, we can just flip a switch and talk to an engineer about the minute details of a project and stuff like that. And conversely, when you, when you lean too much one way or the other, you know, a, a philosopher that's not concerned with the detail and being a technician is never going to be able to execute the vision unless they intelligently appoint people around them that are. And then the technician, which is most of strength and conditioning, is that people believe they exist in a bubble and, oh, the back squat went up, they got faster and blah, 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 forgetting the fact that maybe that might have come at the detriment of sport results and, and being a PhD in your sport. So it's it, the reason it's difficult, I think, is because you have to have those two contrasting approaches. Um at the same time uh, there's there's a real clever quote that's that's evading me right now but it's basically like philosophy without practice is like toothless and then practice without philosophy is aimless something similar to that yeah because i, I like i see it i see it in soccer um like i i almost like and i, I was one of them like five years ago it was all philosophy then it i think it was louis van Gaal when he came in it was kind of opened our eyes to because there's something admirable about someone who sticks to their philosophy. But then on the other side of the spectrum, there's something where a young coach is coming in and they're saying, well, this is right. Uh, it's almost like it's an easy way out to say, all right, well, give me my philosophy and I'll ultimately get any job I want. But it, it is, it's inhibiting people to think a little bit differently. How do we then, I suppose, become flexible without yeah, being all over the shop? Well, you know, I'm, I'm pumping out the quotes here, but like there's that Jeff Bezos quote that he talks about, you have to be 
unrelenting in your vision, but then extremely flexible in the journey to get to achieving your vision. So I think when you talk about philosophy, my, me and my assistant, Scott, we always, we always talk about this Ray Dalio idea of what is objectively true. Because I think the, the problems arise in interdisciplinary teams like sport because we don't have a shared model of reality. So before you can evaluate your own work, one another's work, understand how what you do affects other people, you have to have a shared model of reality or an agreed upon model of reality about what success looks like. So that's where the philosophy is important because it effectively gives you the, the end point, the destination that you're trying to agree upon. This is what success looks like. Okay, if that's what success looks like, what are all of the underpinning factors to success? And if we break them down to their constituent parts until they cannot be broken down any further, and then we look at those factors in elite teams and performers, and then we look at where our guys are, then we can agree upon here's where the biggest deficiencies lie, and based on our experience and our skill set, here's the most expedient way that we can address those discrepancies and put the pieces back together and then scale and progress it year after year to advance athletes closer towards a destination because that's basically training. Where do we want to be? Where are we now? How do we get there in the quickest, most efficient manner possible? So it's, it's almost like the philosophy gives you the destination, but being a technician helps you advance them towards that whenever that young coach and that young intern is it then detrimental or should they hold off on that philosophy until they get uh, a leadership role where that i suppose that that vision is required that vision isn't, isn't really required at entry level is it like that's more about like in the learning phase it i think it's a natural progression because you know i, I had this conversation with someone last week when I, I interviewed them for a job and i had basically had to call them up and tell them that they didn't get the job and they said well all that stuff that you talked about global mindset interdisciplinary work and so on they said how do i how do i address that and i said well unfortunately it's not one of those things where you can read it in a book and be like well i've got it because the process that i went through was we again we talked off air about the availability heuristic you attribute success to the thing that you that you do because you're the star of your own movie so you 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 try and master whatever it is that you, you're interested in initially, and you say, did this result in success every single time? No, it didn't. Okay, I need to expand my horizons a little bit. Then you start to cast the net a little bit wider. Was that it? No. Was that it? No. And then you keep basically pushing yourself to learn more and more and more. Um, and I think it's it's one of those things where it's it's a natural result of the pursuit for success when you realize that actually – there's a lot more that you need to know in order to try and control all of the moving pieces to result in success. So should, should they be, uh, should they be concerned with it? I don't think it's going to be a limiting factor early in their career, but the earlier you can become aware of the need for it and be ready, willing and able to take advantage of those lessons when they appear to you, I think the, the better off you're going to be in your career. And it's not guaranteed because there are people that have been doing it 20, 30 years that still think that, if, if you make the back squat go up, if you make somebody jump higher and run faster, you know, engrave the trophy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, really interesting. The, um, yeah, that, that aspect of the star, the star of your own show that, and, I, and I've done like, I, sometimes I think I was more confident of things 10 years ago. Yeah. I, definitely, I actually definitely was. No, it's not even a maybe. I was definitely more confident now. Now I'm, I I question. I feel as if I know less about things. Well, I suppose then, if in in my eyes, then the difference is, is like my greatest strength would be in the humility of knowing that I don't know everything and that there still is a way more to learn. But I suppose if what you're saying there as well is like if humility is such a big strength in an industry where humility is not necessarily valued. Can you change someone? Can you change a young coach who's who's not aware enough to, to think that there's a hundred different ways to do it? I think, it, it, you know, having spoken to to some people when I when I've tried to interview for other jobs, a, a criticism, and I of me, and I've joked that the people is I've had more clubs than Tiger Woods. 
<laughs> so <laughs> this is the thing. If you only ever stay in one place and you have, for the most part, the same infrastructure around you, this is the thing about sport. Sport is self-correcting. You can have the worst strength and conditioning program possible. If you have a good enough sport coach and good enough recruitment, they're going to make you look like a genius. And if you're always in that environment, you're never going to be forced to engage with reality to an extent because the system as a whole works. You're never actually testing your part of the system. And I think one thing that you do get when you move teams is you're going to get a little bit more of a dose of reality because those other factors around you are going to change and you're going to have a, a, a truer indication of actually what is your impact on overall sporting success. So I finished the World Cup in 2015 with Argentina, came forth, flavor of the month, got me recruited to go to Japan. And then suddenly the the excellent strength and conditioning program that was the reason, you know, I was the reason, you know, in my head, you know, oh, this has been a massive improvement. I go to Japan and suddenly it starts injuring everyone. And I, I remember reading a, a quote by um, Richard Feynman and it was like, it doesn't matter what your idea is or what your opinion is. The facts are the facts. And I had to, you know, come to terms with the fact that what I was doing was not successful right then. And obviously I'd, I'd been made to look better than I was by other factors. And then, you know, that it was good. It hurt at the time, but it was good for me because it forced me to learn. So I think there is an advantage to uh, within reason moving around and visiting different environments and testing yourself in different domains. Um, you know, an extreme one for me would be now I'm testing my ideas. Do they work in, in American football? All right. Sports science and soccer. Obviously, you're well aware there's been a massive explosion. It's not it's not even on the horizon. Anymore. Like it's there. It's there in youth soccer. It's there professional soccer, college. Everyone's hooked up to all these machines at the minute. We've got everything yeah. measured. Uh, but a common complaint is that you know players are becoming even more susceptible to injury and less robust. And yeah. that's coming from coaches and some of the leading practitioners. Uh, Tony Strudwick's been very vocal on that. Yeah, uh, coming from a sport that is as risky, like rugby, is as intense as it gets. Like, yeah. how do you balance injury prevention to to pushing beyond boundaries? Well, unfortunately, robustness is not something you get sat on your ass. So sport technology exists to make better informed decisions. That's all it is. Okay, so it's there to give you information that you didn't have before um, to indicate where might be the best investment of training time and effort to advance athletes towards the stated objectives of the program what it's not going to do is do the training for you. So Carl Valley talks about all the time, the best kind of recovery is don't get fatigued. So you can, you can foam roll, you can massage, you can do float tanks and blah, blah, blah. But ultimately it's a question of if you reduce the threat of the training stimulus to the human organism, you're going to have less of a stress response. And the way that you do that is by increasing capacity. And the way you do that is by training. And, you know, I had a conversation with someone this week where should, should you place a heavy emphasis on specificity and ball at the feet and sport mastery in the training process? And you can make the case that, yes, you should do a large amount of that. But the problem with hyper-realistic, specific – um, training scenarios which allow athletes to express adaptation is that there's not a lot of control and there's not a lot of opportunity to overload and deliver a focused stimulus and that can be physically tactically technically and so on because you know tactically and technically they're always going to revert to type you won't necessarily get the reps that you wanted physically you know the, the metabolic stimulus of a small side of game can be all over the shop then at the other end of the spectrum, you have training which is tightly controlled, so not very realistic at all, but it allows you to deliver a ton of overload 
and focused adaptation of the stuff that you've said underpins performance in your sport. So there has to be a balance in all sports. There has to be a balance of a bit, um, training which develops qualities and training which expresses qualities. And I would say from my outsider's perspective, the biggest problem in soccer is you are you you are training athletes almost almost exclusively in training which expresses adaptation rather than develops it and it's tough to express what you've ne- what you've not developed and i'd say we almost have the opposite problem in rugby which is we spend forever lifting weights sprinting blah 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 so we're developing all that adaptation and then not learning how to express it to its maximum in the context of the sport so if, I, if you gave me a magic wand to solve the problems in soccer, it would be to play less games, to spend more time on developmental training rather than expression, and to use sports science not as a Band-Aid or to justify my own existence. It would be to make more informed decisions about training and to do hard training. When you go in then to the team, uh, an environment where – Again, what you want to play a certain style of like you want to play a more high tempo game, you want to play a more press and style, uh, which which most people want to do. Yeah. Uh, to go in and say like, all right, well, an S and C coach who's on board and and is going to help you deliver that there, but there's there's obviously going to be a period where the injuries will accumulate if they're not used to that there. Yeah. Is there any way around that, or is that just something that listen we're going to expose our players to higher risk, so it's something that we have to it's a it's a period i suppose that we have to uh go through there there is risk involved in everything Mm -hmm. so you every time you cross the street there's a risk that you're going to get run over but you you take certain actions to mitigate against the risk you don't rush you look left you look right you look left again or i forget which way it is over here but (laughs) you look both ways you there's, there's certain steps that you can take to mitigate the risk. So in every decision that you make as a coach or as a sport coach, there's going to be the, the benefit that you want and there's going to be the risk that you incur that something bad is going to happen in pursuit of the benefit. And there's going to be a ratio between those two. So it's up to you to make informed decisions about maximization of the benefit relative to the risk and not paying an unnecessarily high price for the benefit that you want. Uh, Because ships are safest in the harbor. That's not what ships are designed for. The easiest way to eliminate injuries to zero is to sit on your bum and do nothing. Not going to make you very good at sport, unfortunately. So you have to accept that there is a cost of doing business associated with pursuing sport mastery. What you have to do is make appropriate decisions to mitigate for that risk. And that can be philosophically difficult uh, for everyone involved because every time you you want to minimize it, but every time you have an injury that happens in physical prep, you can feel the eyes of the coach burrowing into your head. So it's, it's a tough one. I'm not saying I've got all the right answers, but the idea that injuries can be eliminated or um, is probably a flawed one because it's just, and you know anything for a given risk, the number of exposures, increase the exposures, the number of injuries are going to go up. Um, you know you have to, sometimes you have to break eggs to make an omelet. We'll just take a quick break here, coaches. If you're looking to raise your club's profile in the local community and give them a professional look this season, please check out NFHS and FIFA approved custom textured training balls and vests from Bounce Athletics. Fully customised with your logo and colour scheme and produced in the same factories as the global brand balls that you're already using. Bounce Athletics training balls feature a textured PU outer with hybrid seamless construction so they look, feel and play like match balls. With only 25 ball minimums, a quick 4 week turnaround and a 2 year warranty, Bounce Athletics can still get you a custom look in time for the spring. Modern Soccer Coach Podcast listeners can get a $50 discount on their first order of custom balls or training vests by mentioning the podcast when they email info at bounceathletics.com to begin the order process. Thank you. I'm back to Kier. And I get that, that, listen, you can't do it without 
without the risk. What I would like to see eliminated is this almost glorification in our soccer culture of that you made it through a season without injury. That frustrates me because you're not actually paying any attention to the performance, the results. Yeah. But I think that stems from a a high-profile person who's come over here and is basically pinpointing on social media what managers have injuries without any understanding of what's going on in their environment. Yeah, yeah. Like, are we the only sport who actually celebrates people not getting injured? Surely, surely there's not other sports doing the same. I, I think it's true in the American sports, but in, in Europe and elsewhere in the world, soccer is the most prominent environment because you the, the salaries are so well publicized and all you have to do, and they love to talk about weekly salaries, all you have to do is multiply weeks by number of weeks lost to injury and then you, you've suddenly got a price tag on that. But it's a false economy when teams will not take much cheaper decisions to make athletes robust to that. And, you know, going back to the, the previous question, there are, it, you, you can accept the fact that injuries may happen, but you can also take a lot of action to ensure that they happen less frequently and that when they do happen, you are lessening their impact and you're responding to them better. And when they come back, they come back for longer. It's not they come back, they get injured again. So I think, again, it's a tough one. Um, but like you said, context is everything. So was that would that be then, yeah, we're going to train harder, but then the quality of recovery is going to be better, the quality of the next, the 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 preparation for the next session is it is it encompassing better quality around that there and then watching for time or w- what does that look like there there is a there's a time for everything so again i'm guessing a major barrier to heavy resistance training in soccer populations is the fact that they lose their touch in technical tactical work in the in the window immediately afterwards and they feel sore yeah mm-hmm. i get that but you're choosing either the short-term pain of a temporary sacrifice versus the long-term pain of a four-week injury. So again, a little bit different in rugby and football. When you pull a guy, you're chicken little and the sky is falling and so on. But if you leave that guy in and he gets injured and he's out for six weeks, pick pick your poison. Do you want, mm. do you want the... The, the distaste of missing one session or 20. Mm-hmm. So there, this is why there has to be a reciprocal relationship between physical preparation and technical tactical preparation. Again, expression and development. You, uh, there, there should be uh, periods of the year where a higher proportion of physical work is done and a short-term decline in technical tactical preparation affords you more benefit down the line. Just like, again, not a problem in soccer, strength coaches, physical preparation coaches must accept the fact that they have to pull back in the season and that their favorite numbers that they live and die by might drop a little bit, even though the athletes are actually playing a lot better. And again, interdisciplinary teams have to understand that at the outset that there's a time for this, there's a time for that. And here's how we're going to work in that seesaw fashion in order for that to happen. And when I think to teams where I've been a part of them and it didn't go well, it would be, well, we have a preseason game in in four weeks and we need to win it. And I said, if I gave you the choice between winning every preseason game by 50 points and we finish mid-table, or we lose every preseason game by 50 points and we win the championship, which one are you going to pick? It's an extreme thought uh, thought experiment, but obviously they're going to pick the latter and say, right, you've identified what your priority is. So our actions must be moving towards that priority, not how do we pat ourselves on the back for having a preseason. Because in Japan, we beat the reigning champions by like 50 points in preseason, and they pulled our pants down in the season. So... <laughs> Yeah. Again, I would say looking in the rugby world, it seems to be an unbelievable platform for leadership 
uh, peer-to-peer coaching, just in general, taking more responsibility, accountability, performance, like all these psychological factors mm. that when you watch a uh, three lions or uh, sorry, a uh, six, uh, what do you living, call it? Like living with lions. I know, I know the series you mean, yeah. Yeah, when you watch that, you're like, oh, like that's what leadership looks like. That's what cultures look like. Do the, you know, by improving the physical, do you improve the mental? Is there a, is there sometimes a case of that? I think you get a little bit spoiled with those films because that's every one of those guys at their club team and even in their national team, they're the man. Mm. So you are getting the best of the best of the best in a room together. And obviously every level that you drop downwards, you're going to get more dickheads just Mm. because when I work for a national team, if you are not on board with the culture, see you later. We've got five guys that can do your job pretty much just as good as you can. So I think it's a little bit, uh, you, you can be fooled a little bit. Um, I think certainly there are maybe some cultural differences um, between soccer and rugby. I actually found interesting differences culturally between between rugby teams. So the the most humble group that I've ever worked with was Argentina because I I don't know this, but my guess was so many of those guys were amateur or played their rugby in Europe. So they were used to being the outsider, having to learn their language, learn their customs, learn their culture. It was a joy to be there, to be a part of the team. It wasn't talking about, you know, I, I deserve this. I am owed this. Um, and that was unquestionably the best culture that I've ever been a part of. Um, so I think, you know, I, I just, I, uh, yeah, it's, it's tough to think about like what the reason for that was, but or- organically, I thought they had it very, very good. And when I've thought about other teams that I've, that I've been a part of, it's, um, entitlement is not a good thing. I was, I was in a... I was in a speech by a guy, uh, high school football in um, Wisconsin. Like his team went seventy-two and zero. And he said the, the three things in life that you want to avoid is cancer, alligators, and entitlement. Because once they get a hold of you, they're not going to let go of you. <laughs> We're going to take our second and final break here to tell you about the aluminum folding Dynamo goal from Bounce Athletics. The world's most portable and durable small-sided goal, weighing only nineteen pounds takes only five seconds to set up or fold flat. The Dynamo goal is utilized by the entire North American soccer spectrum from rec programs to MLS clubs to create a dynamic small-sided training and game environment. Available in 3x5 and 4x6 size, the Dynamo goal requires no staking, so it is perfect on all training surfaces. Net customization is also available for those programs looking to create an even more professional training environment. The goals start at only $257 per goal with free shipping and Modern Soccer Coach listeners can get a $50 discount on their order when they use the offer code MODERN, not case sensitive, at checkout. Visit www.dynamogoal.com for more details. Thank you. I'm back to Keir. Yeah, so staying on that, the the rugby background and now in the USA and, and college athletics, which is a it's a different beast, I'm sure. Like, what, what, what are you trying to challenge, or what, or where do you see the biggest, yeah, challenges in terms of traditional thinking in our, or in, or in our, in our sports environment over here? All, all environments. You know, I've, I've worked in a lot of different environments, and all environments have inherent strengths and inherent weaknesses. So when you think about uh, the UK, because we don't have college sports you get you get your hands on youth talent very very early on in their career so you're in charge of their golden years of of youth development when you think about argentina the fact that we didn't have professional rugby team but they still have one professional team the fact that you didn't have professional teams where there's that club country split what we said went and we were in control of the, the training year round so everything that they did was ultimately about how do we win the world cup and there is 
inherent benefits to the way that you that you operate in North America. So there's a ton of money. It's high profile. There's tons of competition for limited spaces. There's a real industry that has sprung up around collegiate athletics. The problem is, to me, the industrialization of strength and conditioning. So if you look at when when athletes and teams do really, really well with physical preparation being a part of that, it's what um, – I forget his name now. There's a dude that I saw speak in Boston, but he talks about the, the musical conservatory approach. You are going to work hours and hours and hours every single day. I'm going to know you inside out. And everything that I do is about making you a virtuoso performer. And that is very uh, resource intensive. You need a lot of focus and you need really, really low coaching ratios. You look at what happens in North America. It's one coach with five, six, seven, eight teams, 100 athletes, get them in, get them out. You're on the floor eight hours a day and you get better and better at delivering the same program day in and day out. And again, it's a little bit of a false economy because you, you tell yourself, well, you know, look how many athletes we're servicing and all this kind of stuff. But without knowing it or knowing it and just ignoring it, you are harming your ability to deliver right training, right amount, right time, right athlete, be a member of an interdisciplinary team. And to me, most importantly, to give coaches the free time to be able to work on the system, not in the system. There is a reason that companies like Google and Atlassian and so on budget 20% of the working week to say, work on something that is going to solve a problem that we have. And it's obviously you have to deliver on it and say, right, show me what you've developed. But there is none of that in collegiate athletics. And it's a very um, siloed approach. So there are, there are schools where athletic trainers over there, strength coaches over there, see you at the Christmas party and that's it. Likewise with the sport coaches. Every person on the team has to have at least a passing understanding of what it is the other person is doing, how your work affects their work, how you can make their life easier and how all of those pieces fit together towards the objective model of reality that you've agreed upon. And the biggest problem to me is that one hand doesn't know what the other's doing. So you'll be like, oh, we're in a, uh, let me think, you know, we're in uh, a phase of uh, physical preparation where we're going to be doing tons of glycolytic conditioning. And then the sport coach is going to have a great idea. Of, oh, we're going to do all these intensive drills and blah, blah, blah. You just did two things that might be more of the same or, or even worse competing with one another. And it's because of that lack of communication and lack of integration between um, the departments. So that what appealed to me about the current job that I'm in and working with, with Eric Corum is that we are trying to do it differently. And we call it, you know, the athlete centered model. And basically from the, the perspective of the strength coach, it's to be in the office of the athletic trainer and the sport coach so much that they get sick at the sight of you. But as much as possible, you are inserting yourself into those environments to see how what you can do aligns with their work. And it's like everyone pushing together towards the same objective, hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> mm, interesting. Yeah. That, I mean, I've, I've lived it. I've seen it. What you're saying there is like, spend more time with the coach, uh, understand, I suppose, educate the coach on what you're doing. And vice uh, versa. And vice versa. Yeah, so, so I was speaking to a coach this year about, you know, explain to me the relative benefits of a 3-4 defense versus a 4-3 defense. And, you know, different kind of coverages and what's, what's appropriate in this time, what's appropriate in this time. Are we going to be a running offense, passing offense? How often are we going to snap the ball? All, all kinds of stuff like that. Because ultimately, if ultimately it's going to, you know, you see, you see this all the time. Whenever an athlete transitions from one sport to another because they're a physical freak and it, it just goes to shit, the reason is because they have not acquired the technical, technical mastery that actually underpins performance. Mm -hmm. So physical serves tactical, technical, not the other way around. And the best way to serve it is to improve the things that the coach says is how we're going to play the game. This is the thing as well. You, you can get seduced into 
overemphasizing the importance in team sports because it's so hard to isolate different um, different scenarios or or look at all the factors. You get blinded by all that information. So the the, the kind of like the thought process that I go through is look at sports where there's nowhere else to hide, and the price of failure is extremely clear cut or vivid. So if you look at combat, who is the most like most physically gifted guy in the UFC heavyweight right now? Francis Ngannou. He's close to the top. He's not at the top, and he's by by no means the best physical specimen ever. So no means by, uh, by no means the best fighter ever. Physically, he might be the most gifted, but he's not the best. And it's like you see it all the time. Tactics and timing will beat physical preparation if those two are absent. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But it's easier to to uh, prescribe someone to go in and get fitter than it is to actually work on the other stuff, isn't it? Like it's, low, again, yeah. lower bearing fruit. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, uh, you, you mentioned there about getting solutions in your current environment. Is there it, Does that require as well more of a staff management from – I mean, if you're in the if you're in the offices and and you're not on the floor, yeah. is, it, is it hiring more people? Is it more interns? How are you dealing with that? Yeah, um, the 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 two people that it could not happen without is the athletic director, because she has to oversee a system that actually says to sport coaches when they come in, no, you're not going to bring your fitness guy. You're going to work with the staff that we have and the system that we have in place you for our system not vice versa which is a a tough pill to swallow i think for a lot of sport coaches um we also need eric because he has the perspective of being able to work with medic sports medical practitioners sport coaches strength coaches logistical people uh administrators and so on because you need someone in the organization that has the understanding of those different areas to help them talk to one another. doesn't mean that he's better than anyone at those particular areas. Like his strength is going to be physical. I'm not saying he knows more than the sport coaches. He knows enough to be able to get them to talk to one another and help coordinate all the pieces because it's the synergy of those different elements in theory that's going to result in the success, not being the best in your particular area and living in a bubble. Last one for you. So whenever we've talked a lot about basically the emphasis on the, you know, the S&C coach to drive this through, but if you go the other way and say, all right, well, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, what's the word, not ignorant, but there's a resistant or a coach, soccer coach, uh, football coach, basketball coach, that the S&C coach is having trouble kind of building that relationship? I mean, what, what are some ways or what are some advice and how to kind of break through that, bust through that wall of connecting with them and getting them a little bit more in tune with? Because, I mean, from a soccer perspective, it's not something that a lot of coaches work in silos because it's a, it's an easy way of like saying, okay, I don't want to know that. Yeah, that's your language, blah, blah, blah. How yeah. can they get through that? Speak their language. Mm. You know, someone, I think someone said it's like the only thing three people that are going to tell you the truth is a drunk, a child, and your closest friend. You're not a child. You're not allowed to drink at work. So you are going to have to learn to be their strongest advocate and their best friend so that when you tell them the truth, the overriding belief is that you are speaking with their interest in mind and that you care about them and how they look um rather than you're being an advocate for yourself and trying to advance your own position and look good and it takes time and it can be difficult but the it would be lovely if the message was all that mattered but it's how it's delivered and the the person is delivered by if you tell me my flaws and i think you're i'm gonna nah he doesn't know what he's talking about if you're from the inner circle and you tell me my flaws, it's going to sting. But I, I understand that you're saying it with my, my, uh, my interest in mind. As I think as 18th century philosopher David Hume said, reason is the slave of passion. So you, if you accept that fact, you have to uh, you know, sail with the wind and use people's passion 
along with their reason, not in opposition to one another. So it's kind of like that Dale Carnegie thing, how to win friends and influence people, relationship above all else, because that is the vehicle to having those rational discussions and, and debates, which is a challenge because in sport, there's always a time limit on everything you do. If you've got a two-year contract, you'd be like, right, we need to be cooking by year one. Because once it gets to year two, you know, and interestingly enough, there are, there are people that are getting this. So the first thing that Darren Burgess did at Port Adelaide was give everyone a five-year contract. And the first thing that Des Ryan did at Arsenal was make everyone a full-time employee. His key guys, it was like, no, you're not contracted anymore. You're hired by the club. No matter who comes in, who goes out, you work for Arsenal. You have some security and you, you can take the time to make those necessary changes. And uh, you, you see that a little bit with strength coach as well. I know of a guy just got a very high level job, eight year deal. Makes you harder to fire. Um, and th there's a risk from the perspective of, of the institution because what happens if you hire the wrong guy and they're, you know, they get expensive to get rid of. But if you do your due diligence, you actually give them the breathing room to, to make stuff like that happen, which I think is very important. Yeah, and it's, it, it goes back. It's like, like you said, the relationship then. It, mm -hmm. it actually means that you don't cut corners with going a different direction and, and flying through everything. I mean, if you've got that time, then you're obviously, you're going to, you're going to value the, like, well, seven years here to build. This is what's yeah. at the forefront. So your fundamentals become somewhat better. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think... You know, for me, that's one one of the the bigger regrets for my career so far is because I've moved and because I've done all these, you know, had all these different experiences. I haven't quite yet found the place where I'm like, you know what, I want to spend 20 years here. And I think truly successful coaches, they kind of have like a project that they can point to and say, yeah, that's my life's work. Be be very interesting to do that. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that's another podcast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, we've run out of time. This was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks so much to Keir for his time and his insight there. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Yeah, we've had a really good response from the Russell Earnshaw interview about a month ago about challenging norms. And that's kind of where I wanted to go with Keir. And it was pretty easy because that's the type of coach that he is. He, he doesn't accept... It's the status quo, he's challenging, looking for better ways. That's the message that he promotes all the time. Um, and I think that's that's really, really healthy for coaches, obviously. Uh, but there's a few people that have reached out and that have said, hey, Gary, how do I get in contact with more of these people? How do I get more exposure to people that are thinking a little bit differently? And I think on social media, where today, where we do have a lot of information, we do have a lot of knowledge, we do have a lot of noise. I think you need to be selective over who you are following and what type of information you are consuming every day. And for me, people that promote ideas rather than promoting themselves and people that say there are many ways of doing things rather than saying there is my way of doing something. Those are the people that I gravitate towards on social media. I also gravitate towards people who can do it in a professional manner and that can do it with respect to other people. And, you know, Keir definitely does all those things. And I think on his social media, he challenges different thinking in, in the sports world and the strength and conditioning world. He also challenges different thinking in leadership. And I think all of these things are so healthy because we've said it on the last couple of podcasts, you know, there is an agenda now that is driven towards simplistic, easy, transferable cultures that aren't easy. Anyone who's coached know that it's not easy, but it, it might be an easier way to sell a product or sell a book. And I think we've got to be We've got to be very, very careful as coaches of how we are taking that information on board because if we take it as gospel that, that cultures are transferable and it's very, very easy and you get the good people on the team and you get the bad people off the team. If it was that easy, then number one, 
we would be very, very successful, each and every one of us. And number two, when it doesn't work, we would then blame the players. And that's not the, the road we want to go down. We want to be looking at our structures. We want to be looking at our processes. We want to be looking at our philosophies and what we're trying to put into action and see how really flexible they are as opposed to announcing it on a spreadsheet or putting it in a PDF and sharing it with everyone. So I think the, the, he's an absolutely fantastic resource to follow, but I love what he was saying there about you know, those different cultures, those different, you know, where I would have thought that the, the, the Lions documentary was the epitome of leadership, him saying, well, yeah, but that's the, the creme de la creme, Gary. That's not necessarily, you know, back in reality, it can be a lot more diff- difficult than that there. So... I enjoyed that there and I also enjoyed the, the, the piece of the relationship between the S&C coach and the head coach and it's something that I've struggled with in the past at the college level where you're trying to get them a little bit more information about the game but it's difficult to do that without time but yeah maybe it's worth spending that time maybe it's the, the conversations with your staff then evolve or expand towards how do we make our game model more transferable or easy communicative to not just our players but also to our strength and conditioning staff and and loop them into the conversations as well uh, so i thought that was brilliant really really enjoyed it and yeah he's a, he's a fantastic resource online so i'd highly recommend you you following him and, and getting in touch with him so thanks so much uh, for listening as always before you shoot off if you wouldn't mind giving us our monthly five star rating on itunes it helps with the sponsorship it helps with the numbers uh, if you wouldn't mind putting a little comment in there as well that would be really helpful too so really appreciate the support really appreciate you listening to the podcast we will talk to you very soon have a great week goodbye thank you for listening to the modern soccer coach podcast for more coaching topics sessions and resources Head on over to Coach Kernine on Facebook or visit the website at www.modernsoccercoach.com.